So we are hosting a citizen science project as part of Rubin Observatory. It's called Comet Catchers. And so you can just visit cometcatchers.net to check it out. And what we're doing is we're showing images of asteroids and other objects that we're not sure if they're comets yet. And we can help find the comets in the Rubin data. So again, that's cometcatchers.net. Um, it's live now. Check it out. Hey, y'all. Uh, welcome to Earth Sky. And a special welcome to any Vera Rubin comet catchers who've tuned in. That was astronomer Colin Orion Chandler of the Dirac Institute at the University of Washington. He's principal investigator for the Rubin Comet Catchers, which is the first citizen science project of the new Vera Rubin Observatory in Chile. But we're here today to talk about another type of comet. We think it's a comet moving fast through our solar system. It's 3I Atlas, the third known interstellar object. And you see it behind me here, moving in front of the stars. This image is from the wonderful Austrian astrophotographer, Michael Jaeger. So this object isn't from our solar system. It has traveled here from another star. And some astronomers believe it's much older than our Earth and Sun, perhaps 7 billion years old. Early estimates placed its size at about 20 kilometers or about 12 miles across. But Colin Orion Chandler and his colleagues now have a new estimate for 3i Atlas of only about half that size. I spoke to Dr. Chandler and asked him, how can astronomers tell the size of a comet that's still so far away? It's currently between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. Yeah, so we, we always see the brightness of something. That's what we're doing as astronomers. And so you can, uh, you can infer a size sort of by saying, well, if it's this bright and the object is typically this reflective, then we have sort of a scale that we can match it to. You know, if it's this, if it's this reflectance and it's this bright, then it must be roughly this size. And that's great for a lot of objects. It's, it's harder to do with comets, um, especially because what we are seeing with comets may not actually be the body itself at all. Um, typically, we are seeing entirely that the, the light is reflected from the shroud of material that's around it, either the coma or the tail or some combination of the two. And so that's what makes it exceptionally difficult. So you can model that dust in the tail and what's coming out and say, well, if it, you know, what we see matches the model of the simulated dust in environment. So we estimated it to be about roughly this size. Um, but it is when you cannot see the nucleus, as it's called the bare body itself, it makes it exceptionally difficult to determine just how large the object is. I see. And so, what is? And so, you have a paper out now on on archive. Uh, what what is that paper suggesting as the size of the object now? Yeah. So, as you're showing up here on the screen, uh, we we estimate it to be you know roughly ten kilometers plus or minus two in astronomer speak. We usually are pretty order of magnitude about things, and I think that's still a pretty fair. Uh, estimate. We did our own modeling uh, in terms of the dust and, and coma material to come up with that estimate. But I do like to strongly caution that it is, it is, it's not quite a fool's errand, but it's a very difficult uh, prospect to do. You can definitely place some bounds on, on, on how big the object is, but it's quite difficult. I mean, just to, to you know, re-illustrate it, if you have a tiny little rock and it's emitting an enormous amount of activity, uh, that will appear the same to us as a much larger rock that's emitting just a small amount of activity because in both cases, the size of the shroud and the amount of light that's being reflected back to Earth is the same. And so it's called, you know, we call this a degeneracy and it can be impossible to disentangle the two. And especially comet scientists will, will really warn against uh, reading too much into the light, especially as the object gets closer. And it's just inside the orbit of Jupiter now, right? That's right, but it's moving really fast. I mean, you know, Jupiter at 5 AU, and even just in that first 10 day span from when our, our sort of lucky early observations that we captured um, versus the day it was discovered and announced by the know it all, um, it had already moved in, you know, a good half an AU. So, really, you know, 10% closer to the, the sun already than it was. And that's 
makes it warmer. That also means the activity can kick up more and you can have more of a, a shroud too. Okay. And so tell us more about using the Rubin Observatory because people are really excited about this new observatory. Uh, was there, so tell us what made it possible with, with that telescope. Yeah, so it's just as a, a reminder for folks though, that's a great image of it. Um, it's, a, it's an eight meter class telescope in the Southern Hemisphere on a really great site in Chile. So it's a lot of glass that can see very faint and really importantly, it can see a large area of the sky all at once. Um, and so it's going to be tiling the entire southern sky uh, many times over a 10 year survey. Now, because it's getting such a large area of the sky repeatedly, the odds of it capturing something in there are much greater. And because it can see much fainter objects, it can also find more objects effectively because the, the further you can see, the more you're going to find. And so in this case, the observations that we have, we call it serendipitous or basically, you know, lucky in effect uh, discovery is that our observations, we just happen to be tying that area of the sky as part of our commissioning operations. So this telescope is not in full operation. It's still in commissioning where we're testing and tuning up the camera and everything. Uh, and yet we still managed to get some early images of it, um, you know, 10 days before its discovery. And also it's, it's certainly the largest uh, telescope that looked at this object that early on. It's so great that, you know, this telescope just got first light. Like when was first light? It was just a month ago or something, wasn't it? Yeah, we had some initial, you know, first light like, versus first photon, et cetera. It's a little bit confusing. We would call it mid-April is when it started to collect actual light coming down from the light path using this LSST camera. It's the, the largest camera ever built for astronomy. It's 3.2 gigapixels. It weighs three tons. There was a smaller commissioning camera on the, the telescope that's one twenty-second of the size. Same chip, same optical path, same dome, same site. It was on uh, last year in October to the end of the year. Uh, but yes, as you say, it just started um, taking data. Its full survey operations aren't even due to start until November, and yet we're already making discoveries in the data. I, I know. It's amazing. I was, I was so surprised when I heard about it. Um, so... Uh, 3i Atlas is generally agreed to be a comet, and so now we think that the diameter of its nucleus or core is a, how much? Well, how much should you say? About twelve or twelve yeah, kilometers? Yeah, twelve or ten. You know, we like round numbers yeah. around here, ten plus or minus <laughs> two kilometers right, right. in diameter. Yeah, so and maybe it's, that's six a good miles. Size. Yeah, uh, it kind of corresponds to what I thought about comets when I started writing about astronomy, which was in the 1970s. And, you know, the idea back then was that comets were about six miles across. And we thought they were all about six miles across. So we had no idea. Um, but that it's at this size, it's still by far the largest of the three interstellar objects that have been discovered so far. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, there are several things that set this object apart. The size is certainly one of them. Um, the fact that we found it so early, and so we have really a lot of time left still that we can observe it, relatively speaking. I was just checking this morning. I mean, we got a total of like 200 observations of Oumuamua. Like, that's very small. We had we had several thousands of Borisov, by contrast. We are already at close, you know, closing that uh, that that total number with this object, and we have many months of observations left to go. Oh, wow. So uh, Oumuamua is only, what, it's about, I think I remember reading 100 meters, something like that? I believe that's right, but as you know, what sets it apart is it's very unusual shape, it's unusual aspect right. ratio. Oh, Five right, because it's so it's months. that elongated shape, right. That's right, yeah, that's and, makes it and very then, interesting. Two I Borisov, which is more comet-like, I think I read was about a kilometer across. But this object is ten kilometers across, so ten times bigger than Borisov. So, is there something about that that changes your thinking about these interstellar objects? It's a good question. It's it's such early days in terms of our understanding of these objects that. You know, we we don't know. Um, that's one of the things that's so exciting about this. And 
you were asking earlier about Rubin Observatory and, and its relationship to this. Well, we, we produced all these estimates of how many we would find, but that was based on just those two objects. And, you know, as you mentioned earlier, Oumuamua was found in 2017, Borisov in 2019, but then nothing for a while. And so it's very difficult to say, although it's not, you know, we love to make estimates, of course, but the fact that we found this one, it makes it very interesting. And the fact that it is much larger than the others sets it apart again. You know, so are we going to continue to be surprised by these objects? Or is this, um, you know, is this really the norm? Is Borisov more the norm? You know, was one also actually cometary? As, as I'm sure you remember, there was some unaccounted for acceleration that happened. It's, you know, it's pretty largely believed that it had some sort of cometary activity that we just never got an opportunity to see. So are they all comets? Um, these, are all, these are all really great, outstanding questions. Rubin Observatory is going to help answer that, of course, as, and, and you know, find a bunch of these, we hope. Yeah, I spoke to uh, Dr. Matthew Hopkins of Oxford not too long ago, and he is one of just a handful of people like yourself who are studying these objects. So there have only been three of these objects, and there's just not a huge number of people that are studying them so far. But he, he made the comment that there could be just billions upon billions upon billions of these objects in the space of the galaxy. Like there could be a lot of these objects out there. And he made the comment that uh, the Rubin telescope might discover, he used the number 50 over the next 10 years so it would vastly increase our knowledge <laughs> instead of just having three to have 50. That's right. And discovering one, uh, you know, and observing one, characterizing one for us is, is infinitely more than zero. You know, so we're able to you know, be much more confident instead of estimating. We, some estimates were as low as, you know, maybe two a year. So over a 10 year survey, maybe that's 40, uh, but maybe it's in the hundreds. Um, and so we hopefully can start to dial in this number and like you said, there are not a ton of people working on it, but it certainly has ramped up a lot of interest. And so we certainly expect many more people to study it. They really offer this really unusual special insight into early solar system, early galaxy. Um, as, as you know, this is a very, very special circumstance. That's why we're all talking about it. Everybody drops everything to work on this because these are, these are very important opportunities. I just wanted to mention also, uh, Co another comet, an Oort cloud comet called Bernelli Bernstein. Uh, and it came from, as I said, it came from our solar system's Oort cloud. It was recently discovered and it's 85 miles across. So that's very different from the six miles that I thought when I started writing about astronomy back in the 70s. Uh, and this is just an artist concept of it, of course. So uh, it would be really quite something if an interstellar object came in that w was determined to be 85 miles across. But I guess that could happen because this one exists in our solar system. So there could be stuff out there in the galaxy floating around that's this big, do you think? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's not just the numbers game statistics. I mean, this one was found by, like you said, Bernard Eddie Bernstein, that's Pedro and Gary to me. Uh, it's a very interesting object, and, and like uh, the interstellar object, it's also inbound, so we have a lot of opportunity still to learn from this object. It is exceptionally large, um, but you know, we, we do think that that Oort cloud where this one came from, that there are quite literally trillions of comets out there. And you know, I also love to remind people that comets were known you know, for as long as there have been people, because they've been able to be seen, sometimes even during the day. Um, and yet we know of you know, 1.4 million asteroids, which is very small compared to the number of comets. But if, if our system for that Oort cloud where Bernard Eli Bernstein came from is representative, then it's not at all hard to imagine how these objects are perturbed by passing stars or other phenomena and get kicked out. And then we get to have them come visit us. And it's just really special. That was astronomer Colin Orion Chandler speaking about the world's third known interstellar object now called 3i Atlas. We're Earth Sky and I'm Deborah Bird. We're here live Monday through Friday at midday in North America. And if you like hearing directly from scientists, please subscribe, like, and share. One Earth, one sky, 
earth sky.